Scott, my dear friend, welcome back to the show. Is the use uh, by Israel or any country uh, of um, explosives in handheld devices like walkie-talkies, mobile phones, uh, or uh, pagers a war crime? It depends how you use it. Um, you know, Israel has had a long history of uh, using personal electronics as a means of assassination. Uh, I think one of the earliest examples was in 1996 when uh, Israel used a cell phone to take out uh, a Hamas bomb maker known as the engineer. Uh, they were able to use a variety of techniques to get the cell phone in his hand. And when it rang and he answered it, uh, Israeli operatives were able to ascertain that he alone was on the phone. And then they detonated the explosives that blew off his head. But only he died. Uh, and Israel has used similar tactics to take out uh, individuals. You know, the legality of targeted assassinations up to, you know, states. Uh, we know in the United States, the president of the United States apparently can kill anybody he wants to without due process. And the Israelis believe the same thing. But that's one thing. What occurred in Lebanon was something completely different. This is where Israel uh, infected society with devices that society is conditioned to bring in as part of normal everyday operations, pagers, uh, you know, uh, handheld radio, uh, walkie-talkies, etc., cetera, um, and then detonated them at the same time in an indiscriminate fashion. They had no idea who was on the receiving end. Um, they could make assumptions that because these were brought, uh, procured by a Hezbollah procurement agent uh, for the purpose of uh, enabling communication between uh, political and um, military components of Hezbollah, that uh, there's a good chance a Hezbollah operative would be on it. It's not guaranteed. What if the device was on the counter and the wife heard it and picked it up? What if a child picked it up? What if the husband had it on his hip next to the child? This is indiscriminate act of terror. That's what it is. It's a war crime in the extreme. No American CIA director would ever approve an operation like this. No American president would sign off on this. Um, nobody in the United States would touch this because it is, by definition, an act of terror, a war crime. The uh, UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights is in full agreement with you, Scott. Cut number eight. It is a war crime to commit violence intended to spread terror among civilians. I call again for an independent, thorough, and transparent investigation into the circumstances of these explosions. Those who ordered and carried out these attacks must be held to account. Did Netanyahu order these attacks? Could this possibly have been done without uh, his consent? No, the way the Israeli uh, national security hierarchy works is that this would have to have been signed off by the prime minister and uh, I believe at least two other people in his war cabinet or in his cabinet. This is not something that the prime minister alone can authorize. Uh, it has to be done with, I believe, at least three people in the in the chain of command. Um, it cannot be done without their approval. Uh, so this is something that Benjamin Netanyahu signed off on. And uh, was it likely done by Mossad or the IDF? And if by Mossad, is this intended to prod a reluctant IDF uh, into uh, entering Lebanon militarily? Well, I believe that Mossad worked together with a, a unit in the IDF called 8200. That's the uh, that's the Israeli NSA, National Security Agency. They're cyber warfare people. They're electronic warfare people. They have specific um, uh, capabilities uh, in this area. But this isn't just about modifying a pager or a walkie-talkie. This was a, a an intelligence operation that was years in the making that probably cost millions, many millions of dollars. Um, it, it required the near totality of uh, Mossad's operational capabilities to set up a front company uh, covertly in Europe to uh, manufacture and then get into the supply chain, um, you know, commercial electronic products that are viable on the commercial market. Remember, they had to convince a Hezbollah procurement officer that they had the product and it was safe to do. Um, so this was this this took years, many years to plan. And so it was a capability, I believe, that Israel was holding in reserve 
for a war with Hezbollah. This is a one-time use uh, deal. You get to do this one time. You don't get to replicate it. Um, they used it, and then they didn't follow through. So I think that this was designed not to prod uh, a reluctant IDF. This was designed for political cover. The Benjamin Netanyahu panicked, uh, knew that he couldn't go to full-scale war with Hezbollah. And so Hezbollah, so Mossad did this so that Benjamin Netanyahu could say, hey, look, it was great headlines in Israel. I mean, Netanyahu got all, the, you know, hey, way to take it to Hezbollah. And now they pr provoke Hezbollah to carry out, uh, the idea was for Hezbollah to carry out retaliation that would justify uh, Israeli response. But Hezbollah's been smart so far. They they actually lured Israel into a trap because, I mean, I'll, I'll deviate just for a second. Once again, Benjamin Netanyahu let his mouth get in the way of um, of reality. The condition for victory here, as set by Netanyahu, isn't about punishing Hezbollah. It's about returning the settlers to the north. This is operation, let's get the settlers back to the north. They will never return to the north now. Hezbollah just said that. We will make your life a living hell. You will not get a good night's sleep. Not only will the settlers never return to the north, we're going to force you to evacuate even more territory, and the people of Haifa are going to spend their next lives in a basement. This is a strategic defeat for Israel. So um, Alistair Crook agree, agrees entirely with everything uh, that you've said. He uh, is of the view uh, that Hezbollah actually um, became aware of these devices minutes before uh, they were exploded, and the Israelis became aware that Hezbollah became aware <laughs> that they had didn't didn't intend to explode them when they did. It was going to be part of a a planned operation, but they figured, as you just said, you have one shot with this. We might as well do it now. They didn't care if these people were in uh, hospital emergency rooms or universities or mosques or where they might be uh, with their children in schools. They didn't care where they were when these devices uh, went off. And well, Israel's, Israel's never cared. Remember, the Dahiwa principle, the doctrine, is named after a suburb of Beirut that the Israelis leveled in 2006 uh, because they wanted the um, civilians to be held accountable for the actions of it. That's a war crime, a literal war crime. They said, we're targeting civilians just to punish them, collective punishment. Israel is a war criminal. It's a nation of war criminals governed by war criminals who operate on doctrine, which is openly in violation of international humanitarian law, the laws of war. And so there's, there's no surprise that Israel implemented tactics like Operation Explosive Pager, um, which are an act of terrorism. The Israelis don't care. This is a nation that's committing ongoing genocide against the Palestinian people that, that, you know, you know, that has been recognized by both the International Court of Justice and the International uh, Criminal Court. Do you think they're going to pause and go, well, gosh, we better not do this because some Lebanese civilians might get hurt? They don't care. They view, remember, they view all civilians as combatants and they view all non-Israelis as animals. Here's uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu yesterday. Much of this will uh, aggravate you. Much of it is uh, uh, utterly disproven lies, but here he is on a roll. Cut number five. On October 7th, the Hamas terrorist monsters burst into Israel, murdered our people, raped and beheaded our women, burnt babies alive, and took 255 innocent people hostage, including many Americans. A day later, on October 8th, another Iranian terrorist proxy, Hezbollah, attacked Israel completely unprovoked. They fired missiles and rockets into our cities. They made 60,000 Israelis leave their homes along the Lebanon border, becoming refugees in their own land. In the subsequent months, they haven't stopped for a single day attacking us. No country can accept the wanton rocketing of its cities. We can't accept it either. We will take whatever action is necessary to restore security and to bring our people safe back to their homes. This purported justification for the use, without stating it, uh, of the exploding uh, paging devices. Yeah, and again, he's set forth conditions for victory that will not be attained. Um, all Hezbollah has to do now is survive and continue firing rockets into the north. Uh, they don't have to win. They don't have to conquer Israel. To win this fight the way Netanyahu has defined it, they just have to keep 60,000 Israelis 
from returning home, which is the easiest thing in the world to do. You just keep firing rockets. Um, and Israel doesn't have the solution. They proved that in 2006. You can't stop the rockets. Um, so it's a it's a stupid move by Ben Yen. But, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but, you know, on October 7th, as if it began there. You know, Israel's been running an open-air concentration camp in Gaza since 1948, the Nakba, when 750,000 uh, Palestinians were purged from their homes. Thousands were murdered by the Israelis who stole their land, stole their villages, and they've been stealing land and villages ever since then. So to pretend that October 7th was in a vacuum, plus he ignores the fact that, A, there's no evidence of rape. There's no evidence beheaded babies, burned babies. He's making all that up. The Israeli press says that, not Scott Ritter, the Israeli press. And he also ignores the fact that um, the vast majority of people who died that day were killed by the IDF. It's again, the Israeli press acknowledges. So he's a liar. He's a fabricator. He's a murderer. He's a genocidal maniac. And again, he all he did is sell Israel down the river right there because he set terms of victory. Just like he said, to be victorious against Hamas, we will destroy them militarily and politically. You can't kill an ideology. Now he says that uh, we will return 60,000 people to their homes. He never will because Hezbollah will never stop shelling it until there's a ceasefire in Gaza. You know, he has apparently canceled his trip to the UN uh, for Friday. Uh, and there are rumors that the um, International Criminal Court uh, will uh, issue indictments before Friday. He he must know from his legal advisors that he can be served and arrested at the UN because that is technically not the United States of America. I don't know how the arresting authorities would get him out of there, but he could be arrested there. Um, you have any insight in any of this? United Nations would never facilitate the arrest of a, a leader of a, of a state. Um, they have no authority to do that. Um, the security people that exist there aren't uh, an extension of the International Criminal Court or the International Court of Justice. Um, plus, the United States would never let it happen. The quickest way to shut down the United Nations were for them to pull a stunt like that. Um, so it, it, it's wishful thinking on the part of people that think that um, that's what the danger is. Um, what happens if uh, on the way home, uh, his aircraft suffers a technical issue and they have to divert to a, an airfield? of a nation that um, does, in fact, plan on adhering to the Treaty of Rome. And uh, and now he can be arrested. And he's too far away from Israel for Israel to protect. It's too much of a risk. He's a war criminal. He's a he's a genocidal maniac. He's a murderer. Uh, there were, will be warrants out for his arrest. And he can't control, you know, the outcome of a technical diversion and in-flight emergency. And so it's from the Israeli perspective, it's not worth the risk to have him fly from Israel to the United States, knowing that at some point in time, there could be an in-flight emergency that requires him to divert to a country that would in fact arrest him. But if he ever made it to New York, he's as safe as the day is long because he's the the national leader of a, of a United, he's a, a United Nations member state. I guess if he addresses the general assembly, it'll be mainly, uh, empty or at least silent. Here's more from the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights, cut number four. These attacks represent a new development in warfare, where communication tools become weapons simultaneously exploding across marketplaces, on street corners, and in homes as daily life unfolds. Authorities have reportedly dismantled unexploded devices in universities, banks, and hospitals. This has unleashed widespread fear, panic, and horror among people in Lebanon, already suffering in an increasingly volatile situation since October 2023 and crumbling under a severe and long-standing economic crisis. This cannot be the new normal. So consistent with what you said, they dismantled unexploded devices found in universities, banks, and hospitals. Well, I'm sure they also um, have devices that were in homes, uh, in schools, um, you know, in, in places of uh, public worship. Um, this, this is a wanton act of terrorism. And, you know, again, if, as an American, I don't know why we're not condemning this vociferously. Uh, what if a pager had been on board an aircraft and uh, brought down a commercial airline? What if it was an American flagged uh, uh, aircraft? Um, uh, 
this is crazy. What, what if the uh, Russians or the Chinese or the North Koreans or the uh, Iranian government did this? Would, would Joe Biden and Tony Blinken remain as silent about it as they have over this? No, we'd be calling it an act of war, not just an act of terrorism, but an act of war. And we'd be seeking international sanctions. We'd be seeking international condemnation. Um, you know, th there's no way any nation in the world other than Israel or the United States, but even as bad as we are, we wouldn't do this. This it, because it's a flagrant violation of international law. It's a war crime. It's an act of terror. We know this. Uh, we would never do this. And yet Israel did it, and America is going to let them get away. We'll, we'll run cover for them on this one. Have uh, have both sets of negotiations uh, intended to lead to a ceasefire? Uh, the ones headed by Amos Hochstein, we all know his background, uh, in Lebanon, and the one headed by uh, Bill Burns, the head of the CIA uh, for uh, Gaza. Have they both been frauds? Is it now recognized? that uh, the Israeli government, Prime Minister Netanyahu, never intended for there to be a ceasefire at either ends of these conflagrations, Gaza or Lebanon? Well, yes, that's, I mean, it's, it's actually almost stated Israeli policy. Um, you know, the fraud is more being perpetrated by the United States, where we pretend that uh, we're serious about a ceasefire, but we don't put the pressure on Israel that would be required to get Israel to agree to a ceasefire. We know what Netanyahu has said. At no time has Netanyahu ever said, I'm, I'm willing to do this. He's been, at least, this is one area we can say he's been honest and said, no, I'm not doing this. No, those are unacceptable. Um, you know, and, and so it's, it's not that, you know, he's being fraudulent. The fraud is upon the United States where we know what the outcome is going to be because we know he won't do it. And we know he'll do everything to sabotage ceasefire, which is he's been doing ongoing. Do you think the pager thing was designed to facilitate a ceasefire or sabotage a ceasefire? Do you think anything Israel's done has been designed to facilitate a ceasefire? No, it's been to further this conflict because only with the continued existence of this conflict can Netanyahu justify to the Israeli people his continued um governance is the is the prime minister otherwise if there was a ceasefire he'd be out he'd probably be in jail um but we know this and yet we're the ones that continue to pretend uh there's the fraud the fraud is in the biden administration which has never been serious about getting a ceasefire because if they were serious you just pick up the phone and you literally make it happen and you can do that by cutting off funding by cutting off weapons munitions uh you can do that by being silent in the United Nations for a week. Just tell the United Nations, hey, on Israel, we're going silent. You can do anything you want to do and watch the General Assembly pass resolutions, condemning, watch the Security Council make a move on Israel because Israel can't do anything without the backing of the United States. And we could make Israel pay the, the heaviest of prices, uh, but we don't. Can Israel fight a three-front war in Gaza, in Lebanon, and against the Houthis? They can, as long as the the war is um, uh, not a war, a full scale war. Israel can fight a three front uh, war of managed uh, escalation, of uh, of managed attrition, which is what they're doing right now. They're losing, but they 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 can fight that. They have the resources to to do this. But if this war was to explode into an all out conflict with the full capabilities of uh, you know, Hezbollah, Iran, the Houthis, and now we're seeing the Iraqi pro uh Iraqi militias getting involved. They just fired uh, a couple dozen um, uh, drones against targets inside Israel, including Haifa. Um, Israel cannot um, cannot emerge victorious in that in a conventional sense. Uh, you know, if Israel wanted to, um, you know, initiate the Samson option, I guess they could try and nuke their way out of it. But again, that's like the pagers. You get to do it once and then it's over and you're dead. Um, Israel won't survive a nuclear conflict. Um, last week when you were on with us, you uh, terrified a lot of uh, people with your intellectual honesty that the U.S. was closer to nuclear war on Saturday, September 14, than at any time in our history, maybe since the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Do you still believe that from the perspective of 10 days later? 
100 percent i i'm convinced that at some point in time the history of what happened last week will be written and it should scare the living you know what out of every american um and i've learned even more since then i've had a, a very um interesting and, and frightening conversation with theodore postal uh he's the mit um scientist uh a specialist in um you know ballistic missiles and stuff i've i've been uh familiar with him and working with him since the gulf war when uh he was the first non-military person to acknowledge what all military people knew that our patriot missiles weren't shooting down any scuds and he's been exposing the lies of uh of of the u.s defense industry since then um but he, he you know he educated me about uh, some technological advancements in our nuclear weapons uh, fusing etc that had an impact on our employment uh which uh causes us to be very forward leaning in terms of uh, preemptive nuclear conflict. Um, and when that you factor that into what was happening, um, it, it's even worse than, than what I was saying. I, I, again, the American people need to wake the hell up, excuse my language. Uh, we almost all died last week. I mean, it just it, there's just no ifs, ands, or buts on this. Had we gone forward and signed the document that Keir Starmer, not an American, by the way, a British prime minister, acting on the advice of British people, not Americans, who were acting on pressure given to them by Ukrainians, not Americans. There's no American interest here. Had he signed that, it would have set in motion events that without any doubt would have led to through cause and effect escalation a preemptive nuclear strike by the united states on russia not russia dropping nukes on nato a preemptive nuclear strike by the united states because we can't win or manage conventional escalation using strategic assets russia has the advantage there so the moment we start firing missiles into russia and they start firing conventional missiles back into europe they will have such devastating effect on nato that the only option the united states will have is to initiate its nuclear employment doctrine nuclear preemption escalate to de-escalate and then it's all over 72 minutes as i said before it's worse than i what what i thought it was last week uh because our nuclear employment plan which no american knows about i just want to remind people in the history of this when john f kennedy was briefed on the first nuclear employment plan after he became president in 1961 he walked out of the pentagon he said and we call ourselves the human race this is disgusting you're asking me to murder hundreds of millions of people I can't do that. You have to give me other options. But the war machine doesn't have any other options. Lyndon Johnson almost got physically ill when he was briefed on it. So too Richard Nixon, who said, this is insanity. What are you talking about? You can't ask me to make a decision that causes hundreds of millions of people to die. Every president's been briefed on this war plan uh, up until George W. Bush said, this is crazy. Even Ronald Reagan, who you know, was fighting the evil empire, couldn't do it. He said, I can't do it. That's why we need strategic defense initiative. That's why he went with nuclear disarmament. Only George W. Bush, when the Cold War ended and we suddenly weren't facing mutually assured destruction, said, hey, nuclear preemption could be in our benefit. And then Barack Obama, who said that's bad, he went along with it. Donald Trump doubled down by bringing in a new category of nuclear weapons. And Joe Biden has doubled down by changing our employment doctrine. American people, wake up. We're the bad people in the world here. We're the ones that have a policy of nuclear preemption and an employment plan designed to do that. So as we edge towards a crisis with Russia, stop thinking about the Russians nuking us. We start by nuking them. That's the way it works. Here's uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov on Saturday, cut number 10. No one wants nuclear war. We said this time and again. Let me assure you that we have weapons which, if used, will cause grave consequences for the masters of the Ukrainian regime. These weapons are available and on full alert status. What does that mean, Scott, on full alert status? It means they're ready to fire right now. Um, and they're not nuclear. That's, what, that's the point I'm trying to, to make here. The, the weapons that Russia would use against Ukraine in, in a situation where they have made the decision to take the government of Ukraine out, to take Kiev, the government sector out, 
are non-nuclear in nature. They're strategic weapons. It's called the avant-garde. It's a hypersonic warhead that's loaded on to strategic missiles, um, uh, old SS-19s, the the Sarmat, the the new uh, heavy missile, uh, the the Yars mobile missile. They all have regiments that are equipped with conventionally armed avant-garde. These will hit at 26 to impact on the ground at 26 times the speed of sound. That's the equivalent of 26 ton bomb. All right, we've seen what happens when a 1.5 ton or a three ton bomb goes off. This will be a 26 ton bomb coming in hypersonic speed. It will take out entire blocks. Um, and all Russia has to do is, is sprinkle Kiev with uh, a half dozen of them and the city ceases to exist. Remind you, they can also do that to Brussels, to NATO headquarters. They can do that to the British. They can do that to anybody. These aren't nuclear weapons. And when they do this, the impact will be so devastating, it'll have a nuclear-like impact on the psychology of the West. And there's the danger. And this is where I would, if I were advising Lavrov, say, I understand your capabilities and I understand what you can do, but you need to understand what that would trigger. And I do think he knows what it would trigger, which is why he keeps saying, we don't want to do this. We don't want this escalation. Can, can those Russian hypersonics reach the east coast of the United States? <laughs> they can reach anywhere in the United States. They can reach the east coast, the west coast. They can hit anywhere. And what they hit goes away. And there's no defense against them. None. Again, American people, we've spent over a trillion dollars building a ballistic missile defense system that doesn't work. It never will work. That's why we signed the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, because back then we realized this was stupid. If you build a missile defense, they will build a missile to defeat your missile defense. And as you keep going, you will always be behind the power curve. The missile will always beat the missile defense. So why not just sign a treaty that says, let's not have missile defenses. Therefore, since we're defenseless, let's not go to war. Mutually assured destruction. And since that's insanity, let's embark on arms control that reduces nuclear weapons, not increases them. And maybe we don't have to worry about any of this stuff. No, we're not doing that anymore. We have no more arms control. We're building missile defenses, and the Russians have built missiles that can defeat our missile defenses. And if we go to war, uh, it's going to be very ugly very quick. Scott, what are you doing Saturday, September 28th? I'm going to uh, participate in a rally that you're going to be participating in, too. Uh, a rally designed to, again, reinforce, from my perspective, what I consider to be the most existential threat to America today, and that's the threat of nuclear war. Again, we almost died last weekend. We're, we're, we're very close to death now because Biden still thinks he can sign that piece of paper and get away with it because people are whispering in his ear. They're bluffing. They're bluffing. Did you see bluff in Lavrov's eyes when he showed you that clip, when the judge showed you that clip? There was no bluff in those eyes. The Russians know damn well what's going on. And so I'm going to be participating in a rally for peace, the Peace and Freedom Rally. Um, you know, And we're going to be talking about a number of things. I'll be focused on how to prevent a nuclear war. Judge uh, Andrew Napolitano, the judge, is going to be there talking about the assault on free speech. And that's, one, again, you know, the U.S. government's trying to shut me down. They're trying, the FBI came to my home to try and intimidate me, silly FBI, um, to try and keep me from speaking out. It didn't work, but it does work. There's a chilling effect on uh, Americans who now are afraid to speak out because we've weaponized the courts in a frontal assault on free speech. And and the judge is going to be talking about that. Gerald Solante, a wonderful man, he's going to be talking about the peace movement and democracy. Max Blumenthal and Anya Perempel, who I believe all of you know because they're frequent guests, they'll be talking about the Middle East, about Gaza, about that issue. And we'll have a special guest appearance by Roger Waters, who will be talking about peace, preventing nuclear war, and providing um, some original music uh, to, you know, because we don't want to depress the crowd too much. There will be some uh, entertainment interspersed so that everybody doesn't go home suicidal. But the goal here is to have a physical rally, get as many people as possible into Kingston, but we're also going to be uh, streaming it live. It's going to be streamed on multiple platforms. I believe we're working with, uh, with, with the Judging Freedom podcast so that it's streamed to the Judging Freedom audience. I know that my podcast is going to do the same thing. We're going to get the gray zone to do it. Plus, uh, the, the, uh, you know, Gerald's going to be doing it on his. If you want to see it, you're going to see it. I This week, I think I have my final coordinating meeting with uh, Gerald uh, today, and we're going to be going on an advertising blitz that's going to be putting out poster after poster, flyer after flyer to tell you where to go if you want to physically be there or where to go if you want to be there, um, you know, if you're too far away, but watch it online. Four hours of your life, ladies and gentlemen, four hours of your life to get empowered knowledge and information to make your vote count in November. 
Scott, thank you very much, my dear friend. I will see you before the sun comes up on uh, Saturday morning uh, in Kingston, New York, filled with energy and enthusiasm and ready to go. All the best, my friend.